chapter number 19, again reading with verse number 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as, and as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake bacon on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. The angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. Father, we thank you for the word of God. Lord, we thank you for this story in particular this morning. God, as we read thy word, and Lord, we see where Elijah's at, where he's been, where he's at, where he's headed. Father, we pray right now that you touch us, God, and help us, Lord, with the word of God. Help us to rightly divide the word of truth. And I pray that the scriptures this morning would speak to our hearts. And God, help us in this day of need, in this hour. Lord, that we're so desperately in need of thee as a people. I pray, God, that you'd help us. Lord, keep us close to thee. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now, what I'm going to deal with this morning for a little while, I almost skipped over it. I'll just tell you. I thought, well, I'll not, I'll not go there. I'll go, I'll go to another course of scripture and I'll I'll deal with something else in Elijah's life and that was my thinking but it wasn't God's plan so I want to deal with this thought this morning depression and its cure depression and its cure for many many years among Christians among born-again believers among Baptist folks if you were depressed you were just out of the will of God now, if you believe that this morning, that's fine, amen, and, and uh, I'll not argue with the point with you, but I want you to know something. Depression is a real thing in the lives of believers. Now, I don't know who may be here, somebody this message is for, or God would have let me go somewhere else and preach, you know, this message in the Scripture. He would have sent me somewhere else in Scripture to preach to you a message. But there's someone sitting here, maybe more than one, maybe many sitting here this morning that's dealing with this thing of depression. And some people may be dealing with it and don't even know it. Some people may be dealing with this thing and not even know that that's what the problem is. Now, I'm telling you something. The devil is a very, very wary adversary. He's a very sneaky individual and he knows how to distract you from serving the Lord. Now, if you look around in society today, and you look around uh, that all that's going on in the world today, it'd be easily uh, to get discouraged and depressed and down and out and all of these things. But I'm talking to you about a man this morning that you remember his life, okay? Remember, he came out of nowhere seemingly, was given a task by God to go before Ahab and tell Ahab that it wasn't going to rain. And uh, he was man enough and bold enough and brave enough to go do this thing. Uh, he was a man that, uh, you know, that, that did whatever God wanted him to do. God had just used him to raise a, a widow woman's child. God had just used him to help supply by the hand of God food for that woman and her child. And he had just went before Ahab again and the prophets of Baal and rebuked them and made fun of them and mocked them out of because he was a man of the power of God and uh, call, he had just gotten through calling down fire from heaven. This is Elijah. 
Then shortly after that, he began to pray that it rained until his servant came back and said, I see a, a cloud about the size of a man's hand. And on that bit of advice, in the previous chapter, on that bit of, of knowledge, he said, go tell Ahab to get ready, it's going to rain. Now we find this man, Elijah, as wicked Jezebel, Ahab's wife, told, sent a messenger to Elijah because she, you know, she loved those prophets of Baal. She was all about Baal worship, and she, uh, you know, she was very upset that Elijah had, had uh, slain those prophets of Baal. And so she, being upset with him and mad at him and angry with him, sent a messenger to him and said, that's it for you. By this time tomorrow, you're going to be just like the prophets of Baal. And that took every bit of the wind out of Elijah's sail, so to speak. That was all that it, that it uh, took to send him into a nervous breakdown. Now, if Elijah, who the, Bible, who the Bible tells us over in James, is a man subject to just exactly like we are, with the same, with the same mindset as we've got, and he had done great things for God, but he was not immune to depression. He was not immune to being fearful. No matter how great a man he was, he still fell into a state of... of uh, I want to die. And that's what that's Elijah's state. Now I'm going to ask you a few questions this morning. I don't know how far I'll get in this message. I'm not concerned with it. I just want to be obedient to the Lord. But I want to ask you a few things this morning. You answer them within yourselves. If we look at, at 1 Kings chapter 19 after preaching to you all the things that God has done through Elijah, this is kind of a sad chapter. In the life of Elijah. It does get better, by the way. Just so as you may know that if you're sitting here this morning and you're facing depression, it will get better. It does get better. Hey, it may take a doctor's medicine. And if you're here this morning and you're under a, a, your doctor's medication for such as depression, amen, you thank the Lord for the doctor, amen. So here we have Elijah who had no doctor. I'm sure if he'd had one, he'd went to him. But he had no doctor, but he had something that you and I have got also. He had the Lord. But do you ever feel like uh, you're just discouraged? I mean, you're just, you just get discouraged. I venture to say to you, there's not a one of you here to, this morning that hasn't faced some discouragement in the last little while. You get discouraged. Do you ever feel like you're just in total despair? I don't know what to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know how God's going to do it. But you find yourself in despair. Have you ever been possessed with fear? Have you ever been just afraid, just totally in fear? Of nothing in particular, just afraid? I, I had a panic attack one, one time. I learned what it was, so I learned somewhat how to avoid that. And, uh, and that's, not a, that's not a fun thing at all. Now, I'm preaching to you as a pastor. I don't even know if we want to put this on there. probably do. But I'm preaching to you as a pastor that loves you and that knows that, you, that many of you are or will be having a hard time in life somewhere along your way. And I don't know if I've even told this story many times. I may have told it here. don't know. One Wednesday afternoon, and it's been several years ago, and my wife can testify to it. One Wednesday afternoon, I went all to pieces. I didn't know why. I didn't know what was going on. There was a lot of things going on, but it had nothing I couldn't handle before. And I broke out into tears and weeping and could not stop. And my dear wife was right there. She's strong, and she was right there with me. And she, what's the matter? I don't know. Well, it's, whatever it is, it's going to be all right. I don't know. 
And at that point in my life right then, I did not know what was going on. And that caused it to be even worse because I didn't know what was going on in my life. Lord, why am I, what, what's happening here? I'm going to church. I've got to preach in a little bit. What's going on? Why, why am I so fearful and, and why am I so broken up? And my wife said, you want to go to the doctor? I said, no, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I want to do. I had a dear cousin that was living at the time. She has since died, and my wife called her because she was a nurse at Mission Hospital. You know her, some of you would, and she was a nurse for many years. And my wife always called her when she had any kind of issue with anything medical, she called her. And she called her, and she said, Sandra, I don't know what's wrong with him. She said, he's, he's weeping, and he's crying, and... He doesn't know what's wrong, and I don't know what's wrong, and I don't know what to do. Do we take him to the doctor? She said, you tell him to sit down and start breathing deeply. She said, he's having a panic attack. He's having an anxiety attack, and he's got to calm down. And so on her advice, my wife sat me down, and she said, she said, just start breathing deeply. And I started breathing deeply, and in about 20 minutes, everything was fine again. Now, there was some release to that. I'll just tell you that. There was some release on the inside to do that and get that out of my system, I guess. And, and everything was fine in just a little while. You say, preacher, what kind of preacher are you that would let such like that overcome you? I'm telling you, I'm a man like Elijah was, and you're a man or woman like Elijah. If the same thing could happen to you. I felt real bad about that for a while until I understood that I'm just, as, I'm just as susceptible to things as anybody else is. And, and for a little bit, I think that might have helped me along the way. It made me a little bit better for me to understand, friend, things can happen to anybody. So if that's ever happened to you, amen, just be glad you had someone there to help you. Now, if I'd have went to the hospital at that time or to the doctor in the emergency room, I'm sure they'd probably put, put me in one of them places. Amen. And after they psychoanalyze me, they'd, I'd still be there, I guess. I told someone sometimes, said, asked me had I ever been to a psychiatrist. I said, one time in five minutes after I was in the room laying on his couch, he was on the couch and I was asking him questions. <laughs> he couldn't figure me out. He thought hey, he was crazy. Now, of course, I say that in jest. But when fear possesses you and you don't know what to do, you say, well, you just need to rely on God. I'm telling you, friend, these old bodies and these minds can get so messed up sometimes that you don't know how. But when you come back to your senses, you realize all the time that you didn't have to pray to God. God was there to help you. And God was there to, to deal with you. And God was there to comfort you even though you did not feel it. You ever have doubts? You ever have doubts? Just doubt things? Lord, is this real? Lord, are you really real? Lord, is salvation really real? Listen, if that happens in your life, it is because of Satan just trying to interfere with your serving the Lord. Now, the devil knows how to get at you. And the devil knows how to attack you. And it doesn't, ma it doesn't mean that you're under the rule and the thumb of Satan when you have doubts and worries and fears. It just, it just tells you that the devil is trying his best to defeat you any way he can. Now, I've been around people before that I thought never had a problem or a worry. But then I got close to them and realized they had the same problems as I did. And most of y'all have experienced those things. Do you ever feel like nobody understands or nobody cares? That happens to most everybody on a regular basis, I think, is you begin to think, well, nobody cares about me. I called a few people last week on the phone because I just, I just cannot seem... To, to be able to visit like I want to be, and I feel bad. And so I, I begin to call soon. You'll get a phone call one of these days. If you don't tell me, and I'll be sure to put you back on my list if I've missed anything. 
Because sometimes I know how the devil may say they don't nobody care about you. But if you never hear from me or anybody else in the church, you remember this, and this is easy words to say, but it's the absolute truth. God cares for you. God loves you and God cares for you. No matter what's going on, God loves you and God cares for you. You ever felt like you was at the end of your rope? I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know. I can't go any further. I don't know what I'm going to do. And the old saying goes, if you're at the end of your rope, do what? Tie not and hang on. Because help is on the way. Eventually, you'll get a word from the Lord. And God knows how to give you his word. God knows how to help you. So if you ever get to that place, say, Preacher, I've never been there, never done that. I don't know anything you're talking about this morning. You just, you just sit real quiet while I preach to those that are. Because you listen well. Because if you're not, you're likely to face some of the same things that Elijah faced. And I, be, I believe with all my heart that God put this in Scripture so that you and I can realize that because we feel bad, because does not mean because we don't feel like God cares does not mean that we're living in sin. It just means that we're under attack of the devil and he's trying harder every day because Jesus is coming. And how better else for him to keep us sedated and subdued than to have us focusing on ourselves and rather than those that are around us. Now Elijah came to this point where he wished he would go to sleep and never wake up. Don't answer this question, but have any of you ever been there? Or have any of you ever made the comment, man, if I just, if I just, if I just go to sleep and don't wake up, the world will be better. I've been there. I'll admit it to you. I've been there. Now, what the problem is, is most people will never admit that they're facing these things. But to, for you to have help, you must admit that you're not anything but a human. We're man created in the image of God and with the Holy Spirit living inside of us and us listening to the Holy Spirit of God, still things can come upon us. That old stick evil, wicked feeling of the devil sometimes just feels like it's crawling all over you and nothing to do but to cry out to the Lord. Now let me give you a couple of things. That was the introduction, by the way, if that helps you. Amen. If not, maybe this will. Now we see the, number one, we see the desperate condition that Elijah was in. Now, up until this point, Elijah had pretty much control, did he not? He was following the Lord, doing the will of God. And he did all that he needed to do that God wanted him to do, and everything went well. He was fed at the widow's house. He went and, and, and uh, raised the, the widow's son. He went and cried out, uh, you know, to God, to, uh, and fire came from heaven, so pretty much... Ahab was in charge, being led of God. But he was tired. Look at what he'd been through in the last three years. Look at all that he'd had to face in the last three years of his life. And this would take a toll upon anyone. <coughs> Hiding in the wilderness, being alone with a, at, at someone's house that he didn't really know the famine, all that went on around him, and, and certainly he had had a rough time. And then the aspect of him listening to those prophets of Baal scream out to a God that wasn't real all the day long, and then Ahab having then following God, calling down fire from heaven, knowing that Ahab was his enemy all the time. And then just to, right directly after that, God puts him alone on the mountain to pray and call, call out to God for rain to come. And when he finally gets through and gets the answer from God, rain begins to come. And, and uh, then wicked Jezebel has her say and causes 
Elijah to find himself in a desperate condition because now his life is being sought. And he thinks God has forgotten him. He thinks God has forgotten him. He was suddenly, he, Elijah was suddenly gripped with fear. And I've been afraid a few times in my life, and that is no fun. Fear is nothing, fear is no fun. And Elijah was gripped with life threatening fear and desperation and alarm. Could this be the same Elijah that he went through all that he went through that Elijah would, would leave and go into the wilderness and not even want to be around his servants? He left his servants and he went on into the wilderness and propped himself up under a juniper tree. He had gotten so depressed and so much in anguish that he didn't want to be around anybody. Have you ever been there? Well, that is a bad feeling. I've been there. So people leave me alone. Don't bother me. Don't want nobody calling me. Don't want nobody bothering me. Some of you nodding your head. Some of you looking like a poor pitiful preacher. Hey, man, I know where help comes from. Just leave me alone. Now, I've got ill before and told people to leave me alone, but I didn't really mean it. But there's been a few times in my life when I just soon not be around nobody. You know what that is? That's depression. That's despair. And Elijah had gotten to that place, and he went and sat down under a juniper tree and said, Lord, I'm just going to sit down here and I'll die. Now, this ain't much of a shouting message, but I'm helping somebody. I feel it. Elijah said, I'm just going to sit down here. Now, I didn't study what, what, what the meaning is of the juniper tree, but I'm going to get there. He sat down there and he said, that's it. I'm through. I've done been threatened by Jezebel. And she said that she was all these things he'd went through, and it took the voice of one evil, wicked woman to tell him what she was going to do. And he believed every bit of it. You know why that was that was would be so-called the straw that broke the camel's back. He had been under a lot of pressure, under a lot of distress, and now she had said this. And he said, "That's it, Lord. I can't take any more." And he went out and sat down under the juniper tree and said, "I'm just going to die. I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to die." But that wasn't in the plan of God. That wasn't the end. We'll read on and we'll study on and we'll get to some more messages maybe in a week or two. But I want to tell you something. He come to point in his life where it was over for him. But let me say to you, friend, it's not over until it's over. Amen? God's not done with you till he's done with you. And God was not done with Elijah. He, he still had things for Elijah to do. So did God rebuke Elijah? No, God took pity on him, and God cared for Elijah. As he was overwhelmed with depression, as he was overwhelmed with just being despondent, reminds me of the verse in Psalms 42, 11, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. Hope thou in God. For I shall yet praise him who is he, who is the health of my countenance and my God? Hope thou in God. Friend, I've been to where in places where it didn't seem like there was no hope anywhere. Now, I tell you, I'm just admitting things to you that either some people don't want to admit, some people are afraid to admit, or some people are too proud to admit that they've been in this condition. But I'm telling you, there's hope in the Lord. But sometimes it seems like even those words will fail you. But the psalmist was in the psalmist. David was in the same condition. He got the same place. And if these men of Scripture, Elijah, and, and, uh, uh, that we know of, and, and the psalmist that we know of, got in such places of despair, do you think you're any better than they are? Do I consider myself to be any better than they are to fall under the same shape once in a while? No, I don't. Elijah 
was very presumptive in his belief that God was done with him. He just assumed that because things were going and that, uh, that uh, Jezebel's uh, pro, uh, uh, evil henchmen were going to be after him, that they'd find him there under that juniper tree and they would kill him there. And that was the end. He was, listen, he was at the end of his road. That juniper tree marked the end of his road as far as he was concerned. I'm getting a message from that, but we'll go on. But he was there under the juniper tree knowing that that was going to be where he thought he was going to die. Psalms 55 verse 3, Because of the voice of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they cast iniquity upon me, and in wrath they hate me. That's what Elijah was thinking. That's what he thought. He was filled with self-pity. Verse number 4, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested of him, himself that he might die. Lord, that's it. I'm, I'm it. I'm through. Just kill me. Lord, just kill me. Let me go to sleep and not wake up. So he himself was having himself a pity party. Now, who goes to a pity party? Me and who else? And the devil. That's who attends pity parties. You'll try to draw somebody else into your pity party, but they don't understand because they don't know where you're at, and they may they act like that they're attending at your pity party, but really they don't know. I've had people try to draw me into their pity parties. I don't understand what they're facing, but I know it's real. But you've got to get out of that. You've got to get out of that. He was, his, his view of things going on was very unbalanced. He could only see the negatives. Have you ever been where all you could see was negative things? You go to weighing everything out, it seems like everything's negative. You know why? Because we forget the positive things that God does for us and God's done for us and remember the good things that God will do for us. Friend, this is, I'm telling you, this is desperate days that we live in, but you look back on your life, what God's done for you, and you believe in your heart God's going to do things for you again, and that in itself is enough to encourage you. The psalmist said that there are times he had to encourage himself in the Lord. You and I must sometimes encourage ourselves in the Lord. So Elijah sitting there under, under the juniper tree, he sat there and he had, he had had an experience that doctors would say today was an emotional breakdown, a nervous breakdown, and he had it there all by himself without the aid of his servant. Which if they had been there, if he had not been in the place where he didn't want to be around anybody, maybe they could have helped him. So I say to you today, if you're in a shape or you get in a shape where you don't want anybody around you, try your best to let someone in. I've been around folks that all I could do was sit there with them and listen to them if they had something to say. And sometimes that's the best thing you can do is not open your mouth but just listen to what somebody's got to tell you. You know, you go to a doctor and they'll ask you what's wrong. Sometimes that irritates me because I'm paying them to tell me what's wrong with me. And they want me to tell, tell them what's wrong with me. And that kind of gets under my skin. You ought to be paying me. If you don't know what's wrong with me and I have to tell you, you ought to be paying me. But every time I go to the doctor, I say, well, how do you feel? Well, you know, I'm all right. What do you think's wrong with you? I'm thinking, do you, how, many, how much did you pay for this education that you have to ask the patient? But I understand what they're wanting. They're wanting to get inside, get out of you, what's inside of you going on, so that they might have some, a little bit of enlightenment about how to treat you. And I know that. It still irritates me. But Elijah was at that place where he didn't want to be around anybody 
And his, his mentality had been stretched to the limit. Have you ever been around somebody who, who, who you got around them and, and they, mentally it wore you out? <laughs> I'm serious. I've been around people that never said a word, but just being around them just mentally stressed me out. I'm going to shut my eyes because somebody's going to say he looked at me when he said that. But seriously, I, I, I can't think of nobody in the church, but I've been around folks that, oh, please, just let them go on. Preacher, I can't believe you said that. Listen, that's what's wrong with us today. We're not willing to admit that we got false. And Elijah, he, he was mentally wore out, mentally stressed out. And so after all he'd been through for all those years, not only was he meant, now listen to me, he was not only mentally stressed out, but he was physically exa exhausted. You ever get tired? You ever get sick and tired of being sick and tired? I told somebody that the other day. If it didn't do nothing else, I wasn't feeling good that day anyway. And I told somebody that if it didn't do anything else, it helped them because they lied. Well, I ain't heard that before. <laughs> sick and tired of being sick and tired. That's good. <laughs> but sometimes we get tired of being tired. That's the way Elijah was. Not only was he physically worn out, he was spiritually tired. Now, friend, here's where the here, here's where sometimes people say that all your depression, all the things that you face is all a spiritual matter. No, it all goes together. When you're Mentally tired, which somebody like me, it don't take a lot because there's not a lot there. Go ahead. Some of you's thinking it. I'll just go ahead and say it. But if you're mentally tired and you top that off with being physically tired because you're going all the time. Does anybody here ever have a good long break? We, we got so many things to make life easier and we run ourselves to death. So we get mentally tired, we get physically tired, and when we put those two things together, it'll cause you not to want to pray, not to want to read the Word of God, feeling like you don't have the energy to do these things, so you become spiritually tired. This is what had happened to Elijah. He was mentally exhausted, he was physically exhausted, and he was spiritually, he was wore out. That's one reason we don't have revival in our churches today is because we are, we are overcome with these things in our lives. Now, what did God do about that? Okay, Elijah, taking you out right now. Elijah had compassion. God had compassion over Elijah. Elijah had some issues, but God had compassion. He's a great God of love. He's a great God of mercy. He's a great God of compassion. And God had compassion upon Elijah. And instead of doing what Elijah wanted him to do, God said, let's, let's, let's take care of this. So he sent him again. Remember, God had fed, God had fed him before. So he gave him again, he sent an angel uh, as he sat there and he lay and slept under a juniper tree. Behold, an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked and behold, there was a cake baking at the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he lay, did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights to do Horeb, the mount of God. Now, <coughs> I hadn't seen this. But what God did for Elijah, forty days is about six weeks. And he'd already been there a couple of days. But what God did for Elijah was give him a break. 
gave him a six-week vacation. Somebody just thought he's going to ask for six weeks off. No, I'm not. I've heard of preachers, prominent preachers that have had to do that very thing, though. They call it a sabbatical, and they take off for six weeks just to get their act back together. Now, sometimes I think it'd take more than that for me, but anyway, he gave Elijah six weeks of fresh air, exercise and roaming around, and God gave him time to where he could think again. Now, Elijah's still in pretty bad shape, but six weeks later, we find Elijah doing this. He, and listen, I believe, and, and I'm trying to take my own advice, but that exercise part sometimes really gets to me. You know why? Because I don't want to. I, took my, I got, got out the other night and took my dogs for a walk, and they, they were worse off than I was. I thought, boy, if, if I don't need to exercise, I need to take these dogs out more often. They both come back and laid down and slept for two hours. But let me tell you something. We need fresh air. We need good nourishing meals. And we need exercise. That goes a long way. You ask any doctor of any patient that they have that is facing anxiety or depression that there are some things you can do for yourself, but you got to do them. you got to eat right. And sometimes eating right is just eating whatever we can get. That's not right. You can look at me and tell it's not. But you got to eat right. you got to exercise. And you got to get a plenty of fresh air. Now, preacher, what in the world has that got to do with anything? I went, I, the other night I went out and took the dogs out, and we walked around the... Really, a, a real block, not that one I told you about sitting in the floor and walking around that block. But we walked, we walked around, I don't know, half a mile or so. And I got back home, and I told my wife, I said, well, I feel better. And it'll make you feel better. It'll do something for you mentally. It'll work out some of that negative energy that's inside of you. Now you're going to think I'm a tree hugger because I said negative energy. But I'm not. Hey, Amen. It's just things that build up on the inside of you that sometimes just getting it out and exercise will help. So that's what Elijah did for six weeks. He got out and he wandered around. I don't know what he done for six weeks, wandering around by himself in the woods. I'd sure like to give it a try, though. But he got out and he wandered around, and then he came to uh, then then he came to Mount Horeb. And here's what happened there. He asked Elijah again when he got to Mount Horeb, and he came thither into a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him. What doest thou here, Elijah? What are you doing here? <clears throat> What's your purpose, Elijah? What is the purpose for you being here? You left the juniper tree, and you've wandered around. You've had your exercise. You've had your fresh air, and you've had plenty to eat, and now you're down in the cave again. What are you doing here, Elijah? And him being those things that he was, Overstrained spiritually, overstrained mentally. He got in his bodily rest. And then Elijah breaks down and tells the Lord all about it. And he said, I've been very jealous of the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am, alive, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. He said, I've done everything you wanted me to do, Lord, and I've been faithful to you, and I'm the last man standing. Do you ever feel like you're the only one standing? You're not. And he said, Elijah. He said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. So Elijah, still being willing to be obedient to the Lord, Behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. God showed him great and mighty things that he could do, but he wasn't in the wind. He wasn't speaking to Elijah in the wind. Now listen, there's a lot of hype that goes around today, and people tell you a lot of things, but if God's not in it, you better not listen to them. When it comes to your, your physical well-being or your mental well-being 
or your, uh, you know, uh, the things that you face during life, if God's not in it, you don't have to listen to the hype. Just because people tell you that you just got to feel good about yourself don't mean that you're going to feel good about yourself. People can talk to you and tell you, well, you just need to lift yourself up. Well, that might work for that particular time, but it ain't going to be an hour or two. You're going to be back down in the dumps again. Your help must come from the Lord. It don't come from the wind, amen? It comes from God. And behold, the Lord passed by in a great and strong wind, rent the mountains and breaking pieces of the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. An earthquake shakes things up. And just because somebody comes around once in a while and seems to shake everything up does not mean that God's in that. It just brings a lot of attention, but it don't mean God's in that. Listen, you be careful with these health and wealth preachers on the radio and television, all right? They'll tell you a lot of good things. They're good politicians, but when it comes to them knowing what the Lord does and what God does, many of them ain't got a clue. You, you know, they come on, they, they, they live in millions and millions of dollars if people have paid them to get up there and tell them how to feel better about themselves. I'll tell you the best, Joel Osteen, amen, I'll just call him out for one of them, and he'll tell you all these good things, but he hardly ever mentions the name of Jesus. You tell me what good is in that. But millions of people will go and listen, and oh, they feel good about themselves until the next time they have to do it again and feel good about themselves. Listen, I'm telling you, friend, God may not be, and God is not in these things, but he is in the next thing I'm fixing to read to you. And after the earthquake, a fire. He wasn't in the fire, but he was in the still small voice. So after the earthquake came a fire. Boy, that sounded like that. It looked like that was good. It looked like God was moving. It looked like God was in something there. But he wasn't in that either, but he was in that still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle. See, he's seen all these things and that didn't move him. But when he heard the still, small voice of God, he, oh, he knew that's God. Remember, Elijah was alone by himself. There wasn't nobody else to have any influence on him. But when God spoke to him in that still, small voice, Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous of the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left that they, that they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness, of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abimaholah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet by thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth uh, from the sword Jehu shall Elisha slay. So he gives him instruction, he gives him encouragement, and he says here in the very end, as God speaks to him in that still small voice, and say, you're not alone is what he says here, yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. Elijah, you're not alone. You might have felt alone, but you're not alone. There's 7,000 down there that, are, that have not bowed the knee to Baal. Hallelujah. I'm glad there's still a few friends that no matter what goes on, they're going to stand. Amen. They're not going to bow to this world. They're not going to bow to the things of this world, but they're going to stand for God. Amen. God did not accuse Elijah of failure. But he lifted him up, he restored him, he put him back in action, and he recommissioned him and said, Elijah, you've still got work to do, you've still got a job to do, let's get at it. Let me tell you today, friend, if you're, if you're depressed today, 
If you want what's what you want to get over that depression, I'm gonna tell you what to do. If you're seeing a doctor, keep seeing your doctor. But if you and when you feel like you can't go on, amen, take it to the Lord in prayer. Ask God for his help. And don't be afraid to ask your brothers and sisters to pray for you. Don't, don't isolate yourself away from those that can help you. If you're on medication, keep taking your medication. Now I say this with I say this with some background behind what I'm telling you today, okay? 50% of the preachers that are in the ministry face depression. Fifty percent. Looking at the statistics the other day, I can't remember what it was, but how many every week are getting out of the ministry because they can't take the heat, can't take the pressure that's going on in these last days. There's no way that people can know everything the preacher faces, but I will tell you what, I'm glad God's real. Hallelujah! I'm glad when I need help, God gives me help. When I get down and discouraged, I'm glad I can go to the Lord, and I'm glad that He can help me. And friend, if I need a doctor's care, He can help me too. Amen. And I'm not opposed to any of that. If that's what it takes in your life, if that's what God will use to help you, amen, you do what the doctor says. But sometimes in the midst of all of that, you've got to get along with the Lord. Get revived, get refreshed. The church needs revival. The church needs refreshing. But just because you've been there or you are there doesn't mean that God can't ever use you again. He used Elijah, and we'll see that later. But God put him back into service and said, Elijah, I've got more things for you to do. And he got up and went on and served the Lord. I preached way longer than I thought I was going to. And you don't get, you, I don't preach this long to you. Somebody needed help from God. Everybody bow your head. No one looking around. I wonder if you're here this morning and say, Preacher, I faced all of that that you've been speaking of this morning and it's about got me down. Would you pray for me? The first, the first thing that you'll ever have to do is admit that you got a problem. Then God can give you some solutions. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. All over the building. Amen. Listen. I'm going to tell you what to do. And I hesitate sometimes to say this because people take me wrong when I do. But if you've been fighting things for a while, go see your doctor and tell him. And if he's got some suggestions for you, follow his advice. But listen to me. You need the help of God's people. You need your church. You need your church family. You need your brothers and sisters in Christ. Whatever you do, don't get out of church. Whatever you do, don't get out of the will of God. Don't get out of church. Stay with the Lord. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. I thank you, God, for these. Lord, many raise their hands, Lord. And I know what it is, God. I know how. I know what exactly what they're facing. God, please help them, I pray. Lord, let them be encouraged in the Lord. God, you're not through with us yet. If you were through with the church... Father, we'd already be out of here in thy presence, but you're not. God, I know that we live in the last days, and the devil's going to fight all in every way that he can. Help us to be found faithful. And God, if we felt like, Lord, that you threw with us, God, I pray, God, you'd help us to understand we're still here, and we're still, Lord, able to be in your service, and God, let us be in service for thee. Help these that raised their hands, those that didn't. I pray, God, you'd give them courage. Father, to admit, Lord, that there's a problem, Lord, to get a help for it before, God, it takes them to the end. 
We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.